Hey everyone, welcome back. So far in our program, we've learned about our classroom hatchery equipment, when and how we got our Atlantic salmon eggs, their life cycle, habitats, native range, when and how they arrived into Lake Ontario, their predators and prey, and lots of other cool things about Atlantic salmon. During the program, we have also heard that Atlantic salmon disappeared from Lake Ontario. A fish that for thousands of years was extremely abundant, meaning there were lots and lots of them. A fish that for thousands of years was an important food source for indigenous people living around Lake Ontario. When European explorers and settlers first started to arrive into what is now called Southern Ontario, they were amazed by this abundance of Atlantic salmon, as well as other species of fish and wildlife. But life started to change for Atlantic salmon. By the late 1700s, people were noticing that there just weren't as many Atlantic salmon as there once were. Some efforts were made to try and save them, but sadly, by the late 1800s, Atlantic salmon were gone from Lake Ontario. Atlantic salmon were considered extirpated from Lake Ontario in 1898. Extirpated means that they're locally extinct. Extinct means that they no longer exist. Lake Ontario Atlantic salmon no longer exist. Atlantic salmon went from extremely abundant, so abundant that you could walk across rivers on their backs. So abundant that you might catch so many of them that your boat might break in half under the weight of them. To completely gone in a hundred years. What happened? This week we're going to learn this tragic story with help from Mary Kate from the Toronto Zoo. But before we get into this sad tale, we're going to check on our hatcheries and we're going to have a bit of a celebration because today we're going to release the Elvin from the condo in our warmer tank. Let's go and do that. All right, checking on hatchery number one. Our filter and air pump are functioning. Our temperature is three and a half degrees Celsius. Our Atlantic salmon are still holding strong as eyed eggs. Checking on hatchery number two. Filter. Check. Air pump. Check. Temperature, 7 degrees Celsius. Our 93 Atlantic Salmon Elvin are looking healthy and ready for us to release them from the condo. Okay, so for my first step, what I want to do, because we've got electricity and water, so I'm going to, before I get my hands into this, I'm just going to unplug the unit. So now I've killed the power. And I'm going to rearrange, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to rearrange the rocks because I don't want to move the rocks after the Elvin have come out of the condo. And then I'm going to undo our nuts and bolts and I'm going to really gently and slowly, because I don't want to stress the Elvin out, I'm going to open up the condo like the wings of a butterfly and the Elvin are going to fall out into our rocks. Okay, so that's what I'm going to go ahead and do now.
As you saw, the elven quickly found places in the rocks to hide from predators. I caught this one for a closer look. It appears to be healthy, with a good yolk sac to continue its growing. Let's now hear from our presenters. Hello, I'm Mary Kate. I'm the Great Lakes Program Coordinator here at the Toronto Zoo. And you're joining me today from the zoo's fish lab, which is in our health unit area of the zoo. So it is behind the scenes. It's not a place you would see uh, if you came to visit the zoo, uh, but it is a very important and I think a pretty cool place here at the zoo. So I know you've been learning about Atlantic salmon with Ben and the Federation of Anglers and Hunters. Uh, and we are also part of that program here at the zoo uh, to bring back the Atlantic salmon. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about Atlantic salmon, why we're doing this program to bring back the salmon. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, myself, my background, and my career. And I'm also going to talk about some other programs that we do here at the zoo to help protect species at risk in Ontario. But I'm going to start off talking about the Atlantic salmon because we're here right next to our salmon hatchery, which is a lot like the one uh, that Ben has that you would have already seen by now. So you can see here we've got our uh, our incubation trays. We've got about 300 salmon in this tank down here. This tank is also a hatchery. It's empty. We don't have salmon in it right now, but it's ready for salmon. So probably next week, uh, I'm going to move some of these salmon from down here up there, and we'll have two different tanks of salmon going. Now, Atlantic salmon are considered a species at risk uh, here in Ontario, uh, especially in particular the Lake Ontario population. Now, a species at risk is uh, defined as a naturally occurring um, species that is in danger of disappearing from the wild. Um, there are over 300 species at risk in Canada, and Atlantic salmon is just one of those. Um, there are several different designations of species at risk, and you might be very familiar with the term endangered. We say that one all the time. And extinct. Extinct is considered um, one of the designations. But there's a few other ones. So extinct is obviously worst case scenario. Uh, and then just before extinct, it would be, the species would be considered extirpated. So uh, our Atlantic salmon are considered to be extirpated from Lake Ontario. And that means that the Lake Ontario population of Atlantic salmon is uh, considered extinct, but there are Atlantic salmon found in other parts of the world. So like in the Atlantic Ocean, for example, there are Atlantic salmon. Uh, next would be endangered, so that would mean very close to extirpation or going extinct. Uh, and then would be threatened, and then special concern, and then um, before that it would be considered data deficient. So that means we're not really sure, we don't have enough information to decide if a species uh, should be considered uh, in a more serious category. Um, but it could be something that we're looking into, or scientists are looking into. And then, of course, the, the best case scenario would be not at risk. So a species where their population is uh, thriving, sustainable, and the threats to that species are not, um, not too serious. So our Atlantic salmon here, as I mentioned, are considered extirpated. And the whole program, Bring Back the Salmon, is to try to restore this population and restore a self-sustaining population of Atlantic salmon in Lake Ontario. So here at the zoo, we've been involved in Bring Back the Salmon since mm, probably about 2008. So uh, a little bit over 10 years, about 12 years that we've been involved in this program. So we've been raising salmon with classrooms and releasing, <clears throat> releasing them into the wild. And we've also been rearing them here at the zoo. So why are we raising them here at the zoo? And why are they extirpated? Well, they were considered to be extirpated or extinct, extinct from Lake Ontario well over 100 years ago. And the last recorded Atlantic salmon was recorded in 1898. That's a really long time ago. But it was quite a while before that that people at the time realized that this population of Atlantic salmon was in trouble because, of course, they were harder, to, harder and harder to catch uh, and they were only being caught fewer and fewer every time until there were none at all. And there were efforts at the time to try and restore the species, to try and breed them in captivity and release them back into the wild. But those uh, efforts were unsuccessful. And the reason for that is because the threats and the reasons why these population this population declined in the first place were not fully addressed. So there are four main reasons that led to uh, uh, Atlantic salmon becoming extirpated. And the first is deforestation. 
So well over 100 years ago, when uh, European settlers came to the Lake Ontario region, they started to set up farms. And in order to do that, they needed a water source. So they would set up these farms near uh, rivers and streams. And they had to clear space. So they would uh, clear out a lot of trees and vegetation around these waterways. And doing that really had an impact on the waterways. Uh, it removes shade, uh, it creates differences in the animals that live there and the vegetation that lives near the streams, which impacted the water quality uh, in a negative way, made it very hard for young salmon to survive. They also started to build dams. Now, most of us know that salmon are really good jumpers, and they are, but they can only jump so high. Sometimes if a structure is too high, they can't jump over it. And this created a, a barrier that prevented some salmon from being able to go upstream to spawn and lay their eggs from the lake. So it was a migration barrier. The third reason is overfishing. So uh, of course, these settlers needed a food source and there were lots of Atlantic salmon in the waterway, which they're very big fish, so it was a lot of food from one fish. Um, but the fishing was just too much. It was out of control and uh, it really had a negative impact on the population because it also became an industry. So people weren't just consuming the salmon that they caught, but they were also canning them and selling them. And uh, without really paying attention to how much was being taken and how many salmon were left in the river. And then finally, the fourth reason is pollution. With all this human activity and um, going on at the time, the waterways just became polluted and the uh, water treatment was not what it is now. Uh, so the waterways became very polluted, which made it very hard for the salmon to survive, for them to find food, and again, for those young to survive. So there was a lot of pressure on these Atlantic salmon, and all of these four different things combined made it essentially impossible for Atlantic salmon to survive, and they disappeared from Lake Ontario. But the good news is, uh, lots of different groups uh, like the Federation of Anglers and Hunters, the Ministry of Natural Resources, groups in the United States, of course us here at the Toronto Zoo, and many other partners have been working to try and restore this species back into Lake Ontario, to restore that natural ecosystem and the natural heritage of the region. So, um, we're going to go over to see our bigger Atlantic salmon uh, that are out on site, and I'm going to tell you a little bit more about them, and also tell you a little bit more about myself uh, my career path, how I got into this role, and a little bit more about what else I do here at the Toronto Zoo. So I'll see you there. So I'm going to start by telling you a little bit about myself and a little bit about how I came to be in this position. So I went to university after high school. I studied science. I got a Bachelor of Science from the uh, University, uh, Trent University rather. And then after that, I actually went back to school and I got a bachelor's of education. So I'm also a trained teacher. So through that time, I've always been very interested in science and nature. And I was fortunate to get this position here at the Toronto Zoo in 2010. I actually started at the zoo as a summer student in 2008. So two summers before that, I was out tracking turtles in uh, Rouge Park. Uh, and I was doing that for the summer. And then it was right after that that I did Teachers College. And when I finished that, which was the summer of 2009, I came back to the zoo and I did some more education-based programs for the summer. And then it was just a few months after that that I started in, in this position and I've been doing that ever since. So it's been about 11 years now since I've been doing this role and it's been a lot of fun throughout that time. Uh, and even before I actually got my first job at the zoo, I was a volunteer. So I, I was a zoo volunteer when I was in university for a summer. So I would come and I would, uh, my favorite spot was to be in the America's Wetlands. There's a nice kiosk there. And I would hang out there and I would talk to people as they came through about frogs that we would see in the wetland and flowers and different insects and all sorts of things. So that really got me interested in wanting to work here at the zoo in, in different capacities. So that's more or less how I got to be in this particular role. Um, but you know, school and learning never ends. So in 2016, I finished a master's of museum studies. So I got to learn a lot more about how people learn in these informal learning settings, just like the zoo here. So zoos and museums are considered, and science centers are considered informal learning settings. So there's a lot of learning that happens here, but of course it's a little different than in your typical classroom. I've also taken a lot of courses 
So I've taken courses in stream assessment and electrofishing and uh, GIS, so ge geographical information systems, all sorts of different learning uh, that goes on as you continue on in your career, in your profession. So learning never really stops. So that's kind of, in a nutshell, a little bit about me and how I got to be in this particular role. Um, and so what I want to do, I want to show you actually where I'm standing. So I'm in our America's Pavilion, and behind me here are some Atlantic salmon. So these are much bigger than the ones you've seen so far in the video series. These are yearling salmon. So these are our salmon that we had this time last year as little Alvin in our hatchery back in the fish lab. These salmon are in here with our American eels. Actually, you can see an American eel swimming around. You might see him in the frame at some point. Uh, and so they're all hanging out in this tank together and we can release them at this age but for now we're going to keep them in this uh, aquarium so that people can see them when they come and visit the zoo because it's not every day that you get to see atlantic salmon and not every day that you get to see them at this age either hi i'm here in our Blanding's turtle room in the health unit at the toronto zoo and i'm going to be talking a little bit about you might have guessed Blanding's turtles so they are another species at risk here in Ontario, uh, and also there are species at risk federally in Canada. And they are a species that we've been working with at the Toronto Zoo for a number of years, probably over close to 20 years at least. And Blanding's turtles are an important part of the Adopt Upon program, uh, which is a very similar program to our Great Lakes program, but they focus on uh, herps, which is another way to say reptiles and amphibians. So the blanding turtles are considered to be a threatened species in Ontario, and they're also considered to be threatened uh, nationally. And that means that there are populations of blanding turtles that are sustainable, but they are in danger of becoming um, endangered or more significantly at risk uh, if action is not taken, because there are lots of different threats to their habitat uh, and to their survival. So. I can talk a little bit about what the Toronto Zoo does to support this species, and while I do that, I'll show them to you. So they're here in a number of different tubs. So I'll point the camera at them here. Make sure we can see them. There's a bunch right there in the front. So these Blanding's turtles are about a year old, probably coming up on two years, actually. And the eggs for these little turtles were collected in the wild. And we collect those eggs from wild turtles and bring them back here to the zoo to incubate them so they can grow uh, and get bigger. And then we move them actually out of this room into another room, a larger area of the zoo. It's actually in our America's pavilion. So if you were to come to the zoo, you could see them. And they continue to grow there and get a little bit bigger. And when they're about two years old um, or two and a half, they get released back into the wild. And this is called a Head Start program, which means we give them a head start in life. So this is helpful for turtles because when turtles hatch out of their eggs, they're very vulnerable and there are a lot of different threats. And uh, one of the big ones, of course, is predation. So another animal could come along and, and eat them and, and then they would not be able to survive. So by raising them in captivity and then releasing them when they're a little bit older, it gives them a better chance of survival because they skip over that stage where they're very vulnerable to predation. Also very vulnerable to other uh, external weather related factors and of course um, mortality on roads. That's a huge issue for turtles. So while they're here, we spend a lot of time looking after them, making sure they're happy and healthy. As you can see, there's some lettuce in the tank here that they were chewing on. They also get fed uh, crickets and those crickets are dusted with calcium. And that's useful for them because obviously they need those nutrients to grow and get big and strong. They're also measured and weighed regularly by our staff to make sure they're growing at a rate that we want them to. And actually what we do is, so there's all these different tubs here. You can walk around a little bit. So we've got three on this side. And then we've got four over here. And what we do is we actually group them according to size in these tubs. That way we don't have really big, tur bigger turtles that are going faster in the same tank with little turtles um, who are maybe a little bit smaller and not able to get the food as quickly. 
And this ensures that all the turtles get food and grow uh, the way we want them to. So they grow appropriately and they get nice and big and strong. You can see we've got a few down here. Now Blanding's turtles are really easy to identify because they have a bright yellow chin. Now it might be kind of hard to see here because these tanks are dark and of course our turtles are not upside down. Maybe we can see it a bit on this one. And it gets brighter the older they get. So they have that really bright yellow chin and they also kind of look like they're smiling. So they're really easy to identify. And they also have a very domed shell. It's a little more um, prominent in adults once they get to be adult size. Um, but as juveniles, uh, not quite as obvious, but they do have a, uh, quite a high dome on their shell. So that makes them distinct from other species, like for example, a painted turtle. And we've got a couple of them in here. So Blanding's turtles like to live in wetlands. So that's where they will make their home, feeding on different fish and probably large insects as well. And they do get pretty big as they continue to grow. So once they're adults, they're a little bit less vulnerable to being uh, predated. So less vulnerable to being eaten by uh, some type of predator. But they are still, still very vul vulnerable to road mortality. So they can get hit on the road by cars, uh, which is still a big problem. So we've got another tank over here with some more, a couple in there. So the zoo has been working to head start these turtles for a, a number of years now, and they've released um, lots of different uh, different juveniles, probably a, around you know a few hundred at least, since they've been doing this project. And there are lots of people involved in this project. So there are conservation authorities, uh, different government agencies, uh, First Nations communities, lots of people involved in trying to make sure that this species is sustainable and thriving and doing well. Because we, of course, don't want this species to move from its threatened category into an endangered category. And in fact, it would be great to downlist it from threatened to special concern, and even one day, not at risk. Put the camera back up here. So the zoo also does other things to support this Head Start uh, program and to support Blanding's turtle conservation. Uh, we also do a lot of community outreach, a lot of uh, programming around uh, the Blanding's turtle. We talk about them a lot at public events. Um, and there's also an app. There's the adopt a -Pond app that you can check out. It's free on uh, Android and Apple uh, platforms. You can check that out. It has lots of information about Blanding's turtles and all the different reptiles and amphibians in Ontario. So you can learn about them, you can learn how to identify them, and you can also report sightings if you see one out in the wild. So that about wraps it up for the Blanding's turtle. Um, thanks so much for hanging out with me today, and uh, we'll talk to you in a little bit. These four reasons, deforestation, dams, overfishing, and pollution, all combined to cause the extirpation of Atlantic salmon from Lake Ontario by 1898. Overarching over top of these four reasons though is a larger problem and that was a lack of connection, understanding and care that many of the European settlers had for the natural world. There is still so much beauty and health in this world though and if we humans deepen our connection and our understanding we can care for the natural world better. Avoid stories like the loss of Atlantic salmon in the future, and even reverse some of the damage that has already been done. There are many things that you can do at home to protect species at risk and prevent future human-caused extinctions. And the first step is to learn about species at risk in your area and globally. And there are a lot of really great resources online to learn about species at risk. So if you want to learn about species at risk in Ontario, the Government of Ontario website is a really great resource for information. And by learning about how important individual creatures are, people will learn to care for them and begin to advocate for their protection. To protect local species at risk, you can start by making your home more wildlife friendly. And one way to do this is to put up stickers, posters, and other decorations in your windows to prevent bird collisions. 
as birds often mistake the reflections in windows as open space where they can fly. And another way that you can protect local species at risk is to plant native pollinator gardens, as these provide habitat, food, and shelter for native pollinators and other wildlife. There are so many other actions that you can take to protect species at risk around the world, including recycling and purchasing sustainable products to protect critical habitat, and even slowing down when driving to prevent wildlife collisions. And if you want to do more, you can even reach out to your local environmental organization to see if there are any ways that you can help. And by taking part in these actions, you can really deepen your connection to and understanding of nature. Hello everyone. Thanks for checking out this week's segment of Fishy Facts. I'm Johnny Nene. This week, we're gonna look at a native fish species called the red side dace. Red side dace are a cool water minnow species. In Canada, they're only found in Ontario in streams that flow into Lake Simcoe, Lake Huron, Lake Erie, and the western part of Lake Ontario. As their name suggests, red side dace have a bright red stripe that runs about halfway down their body along with a thinner bright yellow stripe that extends to the tail. They can reach lengths of about 12 centimeters long and they have large mouths with protruding jaws that they use to help them catch insects from above the water surface. Red side dace are found in clear, cool flowing waters with varying substrates including silt, gravel or stone. They are generally found in areas with overhanging grasses and shrubs. Red side dace eat insects and they have a super cool way for catching their prey. They can leap up to 10 centimeters out of the water to catch insects that are flying above the water's surface and they are the only fish in Canada with this unique ability. During spawning, red side dace will use the nests that are constructed by other fish species like common shiner and creek chub and they rely on these species to guard their nest and eggs. Red side dace are incredibly sensitive to habitat disturbances and they are considered an indicator species. The term indicator species means that the status of a particular species reflects the changes or conditions in an ecosystem. Red side dace are listed as endangered in Canada and they are protected under the Species at Risk Act and Ontario's Endangered Species Act. Under the Endangered Species Act, a recovery strategy must be prepared for species that are listed as threatened or endangered, and one was prepared for the red side dace back in 2010. Threats to red side dace populations are mainly from urban development and include pollutants from stormwater and agricultural runoff habitat fragmentation caused by dams, and habitat degradation from artificial channelization and the removal of riparian vegetation. Currently, there are conservation efforts being carried out to try to help the red side dace, including captive breeding by the University of Windsor and habitat restoration initiatives by Ontario Streams and Conservation Authorities. However, as most populations of red side dace are currently surrounded by urban development and will likely continue to be developed, the future of this unique fish is anything but certain. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed learning about the red side dace and that you can take away just how important it is to have quality habitat for our species. Thanks for checking out this week's segment of Fishy Facts. We'll see you guys next week. Thanks again, Mary Kate, Elizabeth, and Johnny. In our next episode, we're going to be learning about how, with our deepening connection, understanding, and care, we are restoring, bringing back Atlantic salmon to Lake Ontario. Until then, keep on swimming upstream. <laughs>